There we go, we're recording now. So the idea behind inner folding is um, it's based on um, a birth that happened to me and um, you just run through it and talk about what you would do and what decisions you would make and um, we'll just go through it from there. And so first of all, I'll just talk about us. So this is my practice. We work in uh, rural New Zealand and we cover sort of semi-rural, rural and remote rural just outside Christchurch. We um, have in our area two primary units. So these are midwifery primary units. Um, one of them is, in, is part of a little hospital. So there's no midwives there at all. There's a nurse there. And when we birth there, we have to have two midwives to go. And the second primary unit has one midwife there as our backup and six beds so they're very small units and about 30 minutes away we have a tertiary hospital so it's the main hospital for the South Island of New Zealand. Um, we work in pairs so we back each other up and I personally take a small caseload of women um, every month. We all live and work locally. Um, we offer 24-hour midwifery care and we provide antenatal labour and birth and postnatal care and we're quite happy to birth where the woman wants to birth. Oh we've had someone else join us. Hello Melissa would you like to microphone too to talk? <laughs> okay so this is my lovely lady. Her name was Claire. She was um, a healthy woman. She's 27. This was her first baby. Um, she booked with me early and so she um, was put on folic acid and iodine in New Zealand. Um, she had a negative blood group and a BMI of 34 and I think this was quite linked a little bit to her polycystic ovary syndrome. <clears throat> she was on metformin but um, she was under the GP for the metformin and she stopped that early in pregnancy. Um, we do MSS1 in New Zealand so that's maternal serum screening and that, that was normal for Down syndrome, um, trisomy 13 and trisomy 18 and all her scans were normal, um, her GTT was normal and her booking blood pressure was 108 over 68. So her pregnancy was unremarkable, um, she was really healthy throughout. Um, she planned to birth in the hospital as it's her first baby. Um, she wanted a normal birth with no pain relief and physiological third stage. So the idea for her was um, in, in our tertiary hospital we have a primary room which, I don't, <clears throat> which is another story. But uh, we were planning on providing her with um, planning a primary birth in a tertiary setting. And then um, in our local unit, if you have a normal birth, you can't stay there postnatally because the hospital beds are for people who require tertiary care. So they transfer back to the local primary units for um, primary postnatal care. Um, at 36 weeks, she was screened for preeclampsia. Um, because she did have a high blood pressure of 140 over 90 with some swelling but all the blood tests came back negative so likelihood was well, she was still working full time at this point. She was um, a, um, oh what was she, she, um, she was a teacher, she said she spent a lot of her days on her feet. She had her last appointment with me at 38 weeks and everything was normal, a little bit of swelling, but she was well. So the first decision point for Claire's care was she phoned me at 9am um, reporting mild period-like cramping. Her waters had broken at 8.30, uh, 8 um, so half an hour earlier, and she was 38 plus 5. If this happened to you, what would you do? Oh, we've lost Melissa. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, so, do you want me to talk? <laughs> yes, I'd love you to talk. <laughs> okay. Um, I 
talked to her about how long she's been having cramping pains um, and how she's coping with them. I'd ask her about the colour of the water, um, how much water there was, had she been feeling the baby's movements. Um, would she, so had she tried any pain relief um, options if she felt she needed to, even if that was something like a bath? Um, yeah, and how she was feeling, what she felt she needed at this point. Yep, and that is pretty much what me and her did. So um, her waters were still clear um, and they were still trickling, so she popped a pad in. Um, she felt baby movements and she wanted to stay at home until the contractions increased. Um, I, I was actually working at the unit that morning, so I said, well, if you want to come in for an assessment later on, you can. Mm -hmm. um, of, obviously, to call me if the labour began in earnest. Mm -hmm. um, she felt well and she was just sitting on her Swiss ball watching movies with her partner. <laughs> <laughs> so she, I know, she was wonderful. And then I received a call from her partner, James, and the contractions are, um, had begun at 11.45. Now, the story behind it is quite funny. He actually left to pop to go to McDonald's <laughs> to, to pick them up some food. And apparently, as soon as he walked out the door, mm -hmm. um, she established into full-blown labor. And um, she was frantically trying to phone him to get him to come home um, while he was ordering Big Macs, <laughs> which was quite funny. <laughs> so when I, so when he did get home and uh, gave me a call, the, the contractions were very strong. They were every two minutes, and um, Claire couldn't walk, and she felt like pushing. So what would you do? Mm. <laughs> um, gosh, um, it depends how far she is from you, or how like who can get there quicker. If you were close by, you could say, "Look, I'll just come round." Um, or if they were, you know, you could meet them because I know she was planning to go to the hospital. Um, it depends, I guess, on what they felt they could do and how close you were to each other, or how close they were to the unit. Um, yep, she lived 10 minutes from the unit okay. and 30 minutes from the hospital. Okay, so it sounds like it might be best for her, say, to come to the unit and assess her there um, and to see is it is she feeling like pushing because she is in the second stage or is it just, you know, she's got really a lot of pressure and there's more time. I think that's what I would suggest. See her anyway. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and that is exactly what we did do. Um, I was um, I told James to bring Claire to the unit, and I was banking on her being a first-time mum, basically, and not having the baby in the car. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so um, Claire and James arrived at the unit, and um, she was fully pushing on arrival. Mm -hmm. Um, I did, um, she had lots of clear liquid draining, normal fetal heart rate, and I did a very quick vaginal examination. There was no cervix, but I did feel a bag of full waters. But I wasn't very happy with that vaginal examination. And so 10 minutes later, I asked her if I could do a proper one. And um, it wasn't full waters I was feeling, it was testicles. Ah. <laughs> So I called in the one core member of staff at the unit to get her to confirm this presentation. And so what would do you have a primary unit where you work? What would you do? Hmm. It's a very different setup there by the sounds of it. Um It is, isn't it? That's right. Well I thought it'd be interesting if you had a few people here because then we could talk about what everybody would do in their areas. Yeah. But um, so there was just one other midwife there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what did you do? Well, with just one other midwife, I guess if that baby's coming, 
then you're going to need to facilitate the breath there with both of you. Um, but I guess you could contact other backup. I don't know if you'd have like some sort of ambulance transfer available to the main unit in case of needing it, say if the baby was born needing resuscitation and needing that support. Um, and you obviously yeah, talk we do. to Claire and James and discuss with them what this means. Um, yeah. Yes, we do have an ambulance transfer system, but it is only for women. Um, when if we um, have one for a baby, it's got to come. It's a special ambulance that comes from the hospital with a retrieval team. Mm -hmm. So, and that can take up to three hours for them to arrive because they've got to get the special ambulance, the transfer um, unit for the baby, and they come with a NICU reg and a NICU nurse. Yeah. Mm. So, um, <laughs> but luckily, yeah, what, just <laughs> luckily we do... What, Yep. I was just asking you, you've, you've got all the setup at your unit you're at for a birth, so you've got resuscitation equipment and that there. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, and so that's exactly what we did. We set up the, res um, the resus. Um, we prepped for PPH because obviously this is a rather rapid yeah. labour. We called an ambulance because at this point we were still hoping to possibly transfer her in. Um, we also have telephones in the birth room, um, so we called birthing suite, we called NICU and we called in two extra midwives, so we had two midwives for the woman and two midwives prepped and ready for the baby. Hmm. Um, the baby was a trooper, um, fetal heart rate remain, remained normal, um, he did pass meconium, but uh, Claire, she continued to push beautifully, she was, we did um, hands and knees. Um, and James was just with her all the time. We told her exactly what was going on, and we documented carefully. <laughs> <laughs> so then the ambulance arrived at 1.10, and would you transfer in or would you stay? It's a really tough decision, because I guess it depends where the baby's at and, like, you know, what stage is the baby at as she's pushing? At this point, we were hips on view. Then I'd stay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get in an ambulance because the baby's just going to be born. <laughs> I know. And the, th and the other thing is, um, in New Zealand, the ambulances, they don't have anything. Oh, wow. They don't, at this point, um, when this happened, um, they didn't. I don't think they even carried um, oxytocin on them oh, or hey. PPHs. Yeah, yeah. They've just been brought in. Where you are then? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we stayed at the primary unit. We did keep the ambulance on hold though, and they're they're brilliant. Um, they stayed. Um, not just that as well. Is sometimes when there is an emergency, it's all about people. So the fact that we had two extra people there who could give us a hand if it was required was you know, really important for us. Um, we had hips on view. Claire continued to push. She was beautiful. The two extra midwives arrived, so they were brilliant. We had one on the phone to NICU ordering the retrieval team and um, one on the phone to birthing suite to let them know what happened. All this time, Claire was wonderful. She, we stayed hands off. And um, the rump was born at 1.24, and then we had the first leg, second leg almost immediately afterwards, and she birthed the baby in one push, essentially, from umbilicus to head in one push, mm. which was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> amazing. And very quick. We, um, baby did have one minute of delay called clamping. Um, I was extremely lucky, the core member of staff that was with me, she was an extremely experienced home birth midwife, mm -hmm. so um, it was great to have her advice. Um, baby did have a fetal heart rate of um, 100, mm -hmm. and he did grimace, so we did give him a heart with Apgars of two, but after one minute we 
Campton cut and got baby to the resuscitator. Um, he had basically he just had a few inflation breaths and just a little bit of support breathing and um, he was breathing independently by 1.45 within 15 minutes of being born. Mm -hmm. He had pinked up beautifully and was doing really well. Um, he had a normal newborn check with um, vitamin K because the parents had consented and um, by 2.15 he was skin and to skin with mum. Um, the NICU transfer team arrived shortly afterwards and he did have lactates of 13.45. So, do you do lactates? Um, I think if we do then we call it something different. I'm trying to translate that in my head. Um. So you have um, um, fetal blood sampling. Mm -hmm. And we do the yeah. PHs as, and we do do lactates, yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, I haven't worked in the hospital in a little while, so I'm like, I'm not. It's not even <laughs> to get it off my head. Yeah, we do do PHs, but we don't use them too much for clinical decisions. Mm. But we, um, in the hospital, um, they do a lot of decisions on lactates. But basically, if a baby's got a lactate of, um, I think it's above seven, they usually go to a section because the baby's getting distressed. Yeah. So the fact that this baby had lactates of thirteen point four five, wow. um, is really rather serious. <laughs> yeah. Um. <clears throat> And then lactates can mean all sorts of things. Okay, yeah. But um, so they transferred baby into NICU for observation. Um, anyway, with Claire, um, she did had a physiological third stage with an estimated blood loss of 100 mils. She had a tiny, tiny little first degree tear that didn't require suturing. After the baby had left for NICU, she was up, dressed, showered, all her observations were normal, and her and her partner jumped into the car and drove to the hospital. And a little side note is, is when she walked into the hospital, um, the midwives couldn't believe that she was the woman that had just done a breech birth at a primary unit, because she looked so well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There you go. And the baby was in NICU just for one day, only for observation. I don't think they even gave him fluids or antibiotics, which is quite surprising. Mm. And he did have an extra day because he had extremely swollen testicles. <laughs> so, so they gave him some paracetamol. Um, and he also required a hip check at six weeks for breach. And he apparently had a little bit of physio on his neck, um, most likely because he was... Um, breach. Mm. Um, Claire was absolutely fine. She had some anti-D in the hospital because the baby had a positive blood group. Um, and her blood pressure did creep up after arrival in the hospital. So mm. she did end up staying in the hospital for four days. Um, mm. She struggled hugely with the breastfeeding. Um, and she soldiered on a bit. Um, she eventually went to formula. And she just had normal postnatal cares afterwards. Brilliant. I know. And there he is. Oh. I know. <laughs> but I quite like that first photo because you can really see the breech head. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's me. Very, very flat. Yeah. <laughs> so this was him up in Nikki, I think, on his first day, and the second photo and the other the second photo is on his second day. And that was him at I think it's about Four months, by the looks of it. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. There we go. Have you got any questions? No. It's such a good um, that way of using a story and asking questions along the way is such a good tool um, for for everyone. I think it's really good for students when you're learning. So. Yeah. It's really helpful for those decision making those decision-making moments. I think so and it would have been lovely if we'd had some people from other countries here and um, mm. discussed because we've all got access to different services and yes. um, like although we have an ambulance service here um, 
it really is just St. John's. You know, if we want a paramedic, we have to stop and pick one up. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, and I just think, I wonder how that would differ to, say, in the UK. Yeah, the, yeah, the ambulance service is quite different. Uh, there's usually a paramedic on board, and you can, you know, you can let them know that's what you need, and they'll send one. Yeah, I think in our area, I think we have one paramedic. Oh, wow. And we have to stop and pick him up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was lovely talking to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Probably... <laughs> so what are you presenting? Um, I'm presenting session 20, and it's about caring for LGBT families. Oh, lovely. Yeah. That looks like a really good presentation. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully it'll go well. <laughs> oh, I'll come to yours and I'll ask some questions on my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Linda, is there anything else that we would like to add? No, I think... Linda's gone. <laughs> awesome. Oh, well, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> That's okay. There's a link at the top, so you can, it will take you straight back to the conference. Cool. And I'll okay. stop the recording now.